right? So just to set the stage, he's the corporate in the jeans and the boots, and I'm the entrepreneur and the coach. Just a, we like to look like something different. Dan, I'm really excited that you are here and talking about financial inclusion. You know, we, we can make money reducing the cost of being poor and not making money off the poor. And it's exciting that American Express and, and other folks, you know, PayPal is here and other folks have real revenue targets around a mission where the market overlaps with justice. Doesn't happen every time. Fair trade, you have to subsidize some of the cost. With this, that's actually, you can make money, smartphones, big data, reducing the cost of being poor, financial inclusion. Um, that's, that's new. And so we, we've had corporate sponsors before. You're one of the first who has actual revenue targets around things that the entrepreneurs in this room would be working at, things that the Village Capital Financial Inclusion Court are working at. So that's new. Why is American Express there? What, what, why is this now a corporate goal? Why does this make sense as a business? Mm -hmm. Well, there's a, uh, a saying um, that uh, inspires me every day that, uh, um, that it's expensive to be poor. Yeah. Um, and um, that couldn't be more true in the financial services uh, arena. The things that you and I take for granted, mm -hmm. uh, cashing a check, mm -hmm. paying a bill, sending money to somebody you love, um, they're incredibly time consuming and very expensive for a huge population here in the United States and across the world. There are over two and a half billion people in the world that are financially excluded uh, from uh, the traditional financial system. Here in the U.S., incredibly, there are anywhere between 70 and 100 million adults, mm -hmm. almost a third of our population, uh, that don't have access to bank accounts. And so uh, when they want to cash a check, their hard-earned money that they've gotten, some working two or three jobs, they have to go to a check-cashing location stand in line for 30 or 40 minutes. Um, and then just to give them cash, the check cashing location takes anywhere between two and 4% of their check to mm -hmm. give them cash. Right. And then when you have cash, what can you do with it? You can't do anything really with cash. You can't pay your bills with it. So you have to go to another location, stand in line for another 40 minutes and get a money order to pay your bill. So for a typical cable bill, that might cost $50, you pay $11 yeah. to get a money order right. to pay that bill. Um, and um, with technology, that just doesn't have to be the case anymore. We actually can dramatically reduce the cost, simplify the experience, take all that unproductive time away, and create kind of alternatives to what traditional banking is and do so profitably. Mm -hmm. um, so for us, um, you know, my charge coming into American Express a couple of years ago were how can we rethink financial services because mm -hmm. of what's happening with technology? Mm -hmm. And um, what I found is there is a huge population that needs this technology and it inspires us to create different and innovative ways of thinking about products. Right. <clears throat> Has American Express done any official sizing of the market of financial inclusion in the U.S.? Well, in the U.S. alone, um, I'll just give you a couple of statistics, and you can define it any way you, you want. Right. The FDIC mm -hmm. uh, defines it as about 70 million Americans who mm -hmm. are either unbanked <coughs> Uh, or underbanked, as what, right. and underbanked means you use things like a pawn shop or a check cashing right. uh, location. You may have a, a savings account, but that may be it. Um, the study just came out that anywhere between 50% to 65% of Americans live paycheck to paycheck. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, so that's the size of the problem. What about the size of the market opportunity? What what if if you're doing things like reducing the $11 out of $40 cost of paying yeah. a bill and the hour and a half cost, what's the economic opportunity here? So this population spends about $1.3 trillion of mm. spend in the U.S. alone. Mm -hmm. So 
you know, the myth that, you know, they're not disposable income is completely wrong. Right. But what the fees and interests mm -hmm. that the underserved population pay last year alone was $89 billion. So like bounce checks, you know, those checks you write and, and, right. and you bounce. I don't know how many of you have seen a, uh, actually the T's and C's of a checking account recently. Um, but the typical checking account, it, t, uh, terms and conditions, is mm. 110 pages long, mm. um, which is two times Romeo and Juliet. Um, <laughs> okay. And the only thing they have in common is they're both sort of a tragedy in their yeah. own way. Um, <laughs> so Americans spent over $30 billion last year on bounce checks. On bounce Around checks. Wow. $30 billion. And a lot of banks still do what's called high-low uh, sorting. So if you have three checks that come in, uh, one for $10, one for $50, one for $100, they'll cash the $100 check first mm. to put you into overdraft mm -hmm. immediately. Right. So you have $40 in your checking account. Right, right. So they get three overdraft fees instead of maybe one right, that might right. have occurred. Um, and so Institutionalized predatory tactics. It's, uh, there are a lot of bad... Uh, yeah. practices that right. are out there. Payday loans are probably the worst of right. them all with interest rates that can be, you know, 20 times, you know, credit card rates. It can be anywhere uh, up to 300, 400 percent interest yeah. rates right. on that. So my thought is that technology can take that 89 billion mm -hmm. that's spent right now mm -hmm. and, you know, my, sort of the personal goal we have is how can we return half of that back to in the underserved mm -hmm. population? Mm -hmm. How do we take that $90 billion and save at a minimum $45 billion? Because the problem is it's not that people don't have uh, revenues don't equal expenses. Right. It's that the cash flow is very uneven. Right. Um, revenues may be coming in when your expenses are low and then you can get hit with a you know, a car accident or a leaky roof, whatever, a medical emergency. And then once that happens and you have no savings, right. you go into this downward spiral. Right. And so if we can return that money back into the economy, back it to people and start to encourage things like savings, um, you, you, we might be able to make a, a real dent uh, in mm -hmm. the issue. And for Amex, you know, you, you have kind of an exclusive brand. With the brand comes privilege is one of your things. These are folks who are not privileged. How, how you, you've been kind of an exclusive brand. How do you brand and tell the story around financial inclusion? And then you're even putting on a movie here. Yeah. How does the brand and, and the story fit in? Yeah, well, there are a lot of conversations around that at, uh, yeah. at the board level um, and at the senior level in terms of uh, what does it mean for us to rethink what our brand stands for. Mm -hmm. um, and our brand has always stood for you know, in my view, sort of integrity, security, service. Mm -hmm. Not necessarily mass affluent, although mm -hmm. our most famous products, you know, our charge and credit card and the black card and that kind of thing mm -hmm. are obviously at the mass affluent. But the company is 164 years old. I mean, it mm -hmm. started as a freight forwarding company, and mm -hmm. there's nothing less sexy than freight forwarding. Right. Um, we basically sent uh, over Stagecoach Mm -hmm. um, and the Pony Express uh, packages <coughs> from one coast to the other coast for people that were going mm -hmm. out west and needed to move right. things. And it that was an Express, yeah. It, yeah. Right, it was yeah. literally, that's where it came. Wells Fargo and uh, American Express were together and yeah. Uh, yeah. created this. And mm -hmm. so um, the brand has not always been mass affluent. It's, mm -hmm. It started off more populous than mm -hmm. that. But the... Um, the issue for us is that technology is fundamentally changing financial services right, right now. If you stand still, you will fall behind. And honestly, we could now, for the first time with technology, think about new segments of the population in ways that we never could do before mm -hmm. and serve them with a great value proposition. Right. And that, to me, was the key. Big data, smartphones, make the poor You've got to get software platforms smartphones, and then relationships with a bunch of retailers to reimagine what banking could be out there. And you can do that profitably, but mm -hmm. be a consumer champion at the same time. Mm -hmm. 
And so our whole idea was, and the rallying cry in the company was, move our brand from being exclusive to being inclusive. Mm -hmm. And that was a big step yeah, for the company. Yeah. And that's, the time that it's a pivot for some a huge, huge company, huge pivot yeah. uh, for American Express. But when we saw the success we were having with some of the products that you mentioned, yeah. you know, it really started to resonate. And it's inspiring, quite frankly, to be part of a company that's actually trying to address financial exclusion. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And why the movie? You've got they've got a great documentary that, that is showing here. Uh, why tell a story about it? Why, why tell the story of the need the way this movie does? And if you haven't seen it, you should see it. It's, we're showing it. Yeah, so um, the documentary is called Spent Looking mm -hmm. for Change. Right. Um, we worked with um, Davis Guggenheim, who some of you may uh, know of. He did An Inconvenient Truth and Waiting for Superman. And um, what we really wanted to do um, is that people hear statistics around financial exclusion, right. you know, like 70 million people or 89 billion of fees. And, but most people do not understand that this isn't just about, you know, the very lower income level. This is really about the new middle class is mm -hmm. the way that I define it. Right. Every single one of us in this room right. either knows a friend or personally or a family member who is struggling mm -hmm. right now sure. uh, in some way, shape, or form. More and now that's than happening. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It's happening in my family. It's happening to everybody. We all know somebody. And what we wanted to do is, with this documentary, and I encourage everybody to watch it. It's 38 minutes long. It doesn't take uh, a lot of time. Um, but we released it on YouTube yeah. um, because we wanted... We didn't want to do a, f whatever those elite film festival right, things right, are. Yeah, yeah. We just was like, let's release this free of charge on YouTube. Just about 18 million people have seen the 18 documentary. Million have seen 18 the documentary. million wow. people, yeah. um, which is wild. We had a couple of members of a couple of senators and congressmen put out press releases saying, you know, all Americans should see this. Yeah. And the reason we put out the movie, and there's nothing about American Express in there. We, it's like at the very end of their credits that say we help sponsor it, but mm -hmm. it was to put a human face on right. the problem. Yeah. Because if you really want to start a conversation about financial inclusion and have it be a real issue, it, it's a little like I saw some of the presentations that some of the folks did this morning, yeah. and they tell stories right. about individuals, and it makes things come alive. Right. And what I think to really really address this problem, there needs to be a whole ecosystem that comes together. It can't be government. We can't mm -hmm. rely on the government to right. address this problem. Sure. They don't have the resources to go right. and do it. Or the will. And it's a very divided, yeah. you know, uh, mm -hmm. very partisan body right now. And so to expect them to pass legislation of some sort that is going to fundamentally fix financial exclusion I, I just don't think we can count on that. Mm -hmm. I also don't think we can just count on academia to put out research papers, mm -hmm. although they put out extremely important bodies of work, or the nonprofit world. This has to be a partnership between government, regulators, private enterprise, public, NGO, mm -hmm. that kind mm -hmm. of thing. And so we wanted this conversation to right. start yeah. with this, and we wanted people to not just intellectually get the problem, right. but emotionally right. get the problem. And we show this at the Consumer Financial uh, Services Board, the CFPB, yeah. um, and to their board. Right. And after the film ended, like the, the head of it said, we gotta take a couple of minutes just to compose ourselves because yeah. it's heartbreaking when you right. see what yeah. people go it through. Is. It really, it can bring tears to your eyes. Right. And, you know, you're a big company and you want to figure out what to do next and, and where to move. So you're doing a lot with Amex Ventures, working with startups. Tell me how that works. Yeah. And so how we, you make a decision. So we've got a couple of things that we are trying to do. I mean, one of the things is that we do have some resources within American Express to leverage against this problem. Right. 
And um, we are doing a uh, financial inclusion lab in which we are asking uh, academia to submit research, which we will fund. Mm -hmm. um, and that website goes live uh, later today. We also set up a venture um, uh, arm here in uh, Silicon Valley in which we look to uh, invest in companies that are promoting financial inclusion. Um, we've um, uh, we set up a hundred million dollar fund uh, out here. We look at kind of uh, a couple of areas, but financial inclusion is our one of our biggest. We just closed our first um, uh, round in a company called Signify mm -hmm. yesterday. I think mm -hmm. we announced it this morning. Right. Signify works in seven developing markets uh, where they, on an opt-in basis from customers, look at cell phone records and mm -hmm. do an algorithm to look at credit worthiness. Because as many people know, traditional FICO scores and you know your credit worthiness scores they don't look at things like your rent payment or, you know, what's your most recent record. I mean, there's a lot of things they exclude. Right. And therefore, people can't get a loan at a reasonable interest rate because so much of the data is not used. And so right. we think that this is just one very interesting model of mm -hmm. many um, to support in looking at all of the different forms of data that might form sort of a, a different type of scoring methodology mm -hmm. to extend credit. Because if you can extend credit to somebody at reasonable interest rates or an in installment loan capacity as opposed to forcing them to go to pawn shops or right. you know, give up their loved items or, or go to payday lenders right. or title loan uh, companies, that's a good thing. Right. To go so doing. big data lets you extend the credit. Yeah, ratio. exactly. <clears throat> and your co-investor there is a Midiard network, who's yes. one of our long and supporters here, but also been involved with it forever. Right. So did you? This is your first investment. It's also obviously your first co-investment out of this thing. How did you have to figure out how to partner, how to make the deal work and come to terms? Well, we have a venture um, arm out here. There's six yeah. people out here in Silicon Valley. Right. They're incredibly experienced in looking at the right entrepreneurial community, the startup community. We looked at over 300 companies last mm -hmm. year, mm. uh, for instance. And so we encourage anybody who's working in the arena of financial inclusion uh, to submit uh, mm -hmm. to us. We look at all of them. We do screening criteria mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, around it. And uh, you know, we want to invest in quite a number of companies in this yeah. arena. Yeah. So we just have a little bit of time, I can see the clock. Where will this be in five or six years? What do you see happening? So I think we're entering the era of uh, the non-bank, is the way that I think about it, mm. where you can do, like, the bank branch infrastructure is such an antiquated, out-of-date concept. It's incredibly right. expensive. Bank branches, you know, thousands close every year. Where do they close? All, 97%, in neighborhoods where the medium income is below the national average. Right. right? So they're putting bank branches in rich uh, neighborhoods, taking them out right. of, uh, of poor neighborhoods. And, but the great thing is we don't need bank branches anymore. We right. don't need to go to a bank branch to cash currency, to get a checking account. You can do all of this now in the palm of your hand with right. a smartphone, or even a feature phone through text type of uh, uh, functionality and software platforms and go to a retail store and have a, a cashier be mm -hmm. sort of the equivalent of what a teller used right. to be. And so this idea of the post office maybe doing something, there's some very innovative thinking about right. you know, how you can reimagine uh, consumer financial services. And I think it can be extraordinarily powerful in solving this issue if we um, if we all come together around it. Yeah, that's great. We could talk more, but it looks like we're out of time. Okay, thank you all very right. much. It's an honor you. to be here. Thank that you. Great. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Dan.